Thank you. The, the next question, please. Hello, my name is Tony Jenkins. Experiments have suggested choices are made before we are conscious of making a decision. Is consciousness a conductor, participant or observer when we decide on a course of action? That's a great question. <laughs> Who would like to start? I mean, this is a really interesting story of experimental cognitive science. So the experiments that you're referring to were conducted in the 1980s by Benjamin Libet, showing that you can detect um, correlates of um, a choice that someone's going to make in brain activity before they become consciously aware of, of um, making that choice. And recent computational models have suggested that actually maybe we're interpreting those data um, the wrong way around. That actually what's happening is that it's the fact that the experimenter has back averaged that activity with respect to the time of conscious awareness that leads to this ramp-like signal that we then interpret as being somehow some kind of precognition in the brain before we make the choice. And I think that's now been largely shown to be uh, not really the right way of thinking about those data. So I, I'm skeptical that there really is this big disconnect. I, I think it's absolutely true. There's lots of internal brain processes that we're unaware of. But I think when we are making a choice, our conscious experience largely goes in line with the timing of that choice as well. I think that the question of free will, which is, which is really the question here, right? Does consciousness... Know, briefly, then. <laughs> <laughs> Another three weeks, right? Who's but doing but no, does consciousness now? come along with our, with our voluntary decisions? That, that's the qu Is it an observer? Is it a participant? I, I think I'm very much on the side that it's a, a participant. The idea that, that consciousness kind of reaches in and changes what the brain does so that it would do something different. I think that's, that's something we don't even need. That's a kind of free will that is not necessary to explain what we do or even what it feels like to exercise voluntary control over our action. I think we have just as much freedom to do what we want to do as we need, and consciousness is part of that way in which we escape the, uh, the chains of immediacy and do things that are less constrained by uh, what's happening around us at this precise moment. And that's all the free will that we need, and that's all the free will that we have. Do Can we, we have agree that we are doing philosophy to some degree now? Of I course. Think, I think yeah. Do we have free I will? Didn't, I didn't bring this up myself. Um, I, I don't think we have free will. Um, I also I agree with the suspicion of, of Libet's experiments. I think that that's a, it's, a, it's a bad basis, that experiment in particular, to ground the view that there's no free will. But I think there are just good philosophical reasons that, there are no free, that there's no free will, which I won't go into because it's perhaps tangential. But the question as relates to consciousness, and I suppose the science of consciousness, it's like, you know, what is the role of the agent here? Are you observing? Are you doing? Are you, the, are you the progenitor of this behavior? And I think one of the most interesting places to look to answer this question is split brain patients. So most people know that the, the brain is split into two hemispheres, right? And there used to be a quite extreme uh, remedy for epilepsy. For extreme cases of epilepsy, an extreme treatment would be the severing of the connective tissue. The, the corpus callosum connects the two hemispheres. They can still communicate a little bit afterwards through other means, but basically it means that your two hemispheres are not communicating with each other very well. And the strange thing about it is such people seem to just be completely normal. You'd meet them and you wouldn't even know that there was anything wrong with them, except in a few circumstances. So you might know that the right hemisphere of the brain broadly governs the left visual field, the left hand, the left-hand side of your body, and the left hemisphere governs the right, visual, uh, the right visual field. It's also the case that the left brain is thought to be the, the language processor. This is where you get your sort of words. The words that are coming out of my mouth are being governed by the left brain. And the right brain is typically in popular culture thought of as the sort of creative one. You know, it's more imagery that's going on in the right brain. So here's an interesting experiment. Take a split brain patient, someone who's had their, their brain severed in that way. You can show instructions and information to just one side of the brain and not the other. In one experiment, I can't remember the experimenter's name, people who'd signed up for an experiment, so they were awaiting instructions, these split brain patients, they were given the instruction just to their right brain to get up and walk over there. It says, go and walk over to the door. So they stand up, they walk over, and they stand by the door. And then the experimenter says to them in words, why did you just do that? And you know what they say? It would be weird enough if they said, I don't know, right? That would be really strange. But they don't even do that. 
they make up a reason. <laughs> and the funniest thing about this is that they're not lying. They're not just embarrassed and like, oh, uh, uh. they say something like, oh, I was, um, I was getting warm and I just went to get some air. And they believe it. Even though we know the reason they did it is because they were fed this instruction. But it implies that there's this idea of the left brain as the interpreter, as, as, as it's called, whereby the right brain sort of does stuff and then the left brain comes up with why it was done. And so on the question of whether you know, we are observers to our own behaviors, I think this can offer some insight. And it's obvious in the split brain patient, but something like that might be going on in normal, normally functioning brains as well. Uh, it's just less easy to measure. So I think there's a, a lot to be said for the idea that a lot of the time when we think we, we have access to the reasons why we're choosing to do particular things, is actually retrospective, made up, and essentially illusory. We've got time for one more question.